the term beginner species does not have a negative connotation, I promise you. I'd like to show you that by the end of this episode. Fine, call it laziness if you want, but I think this is pretty cool, and I made it a couple days ago. So there are a few traits that do qualify a beginner species. Of course, you're not going to have a whole lot of experience with tarantulas in general, how they move, how they act. So you do want to follow these guidelines in general. First off, they cannot be very fast. You don't know how they move, you don't know how they bolt. You want to have them move relatively slow, even if they are skittish. You can be skittish and slow at the same time. Number two, and this is probably the most important one, they don't have medically significant venom. Real quick, what do I mean by that? It means that if you get bit, you won't need to go to the hospital. Number three, docility, being a docile tarantula. I'm actually not a huge fan of this term because it implies that the tarantula will always be receptive to you. Tarantulas have mood swings. Some of the most docile relative species I've had have tried to bite me in the past. Docility means that the tarantula is tolerating you, not that it likes you. We're talking about generalities here. It won't generally try and kill you. Number four, hardiness. It needs to be able to handle you making mistakes drying it out too much, making it too humid, not feeding it enough, feeding it too much, so on and so forth. Number five would be availability. I'm not going to recommend a spider that costs $400 as a sling. That's not a beginner species. A beginner species is one that you're going to be able to find relatively easily either as a sling or as a juvenile or as an adult. You'll be able to find them readily no matter what, in the United States at least. Number six not a pet hole or a ghost. What do I mean by that? Some tarantulas burrow, and once they burrow, they become pet holes. Furthermore, some tarantulas make a web tube, the arboreals, and they are a ghost. You will see their feet when they're hungry, and then that's about it. That's not fun as a beginner keeper. That's fine and dandy when you're an advanced keeper, but if this is your first tarantula, that's not very fun. All right, those are the generalities out of the way. You will not find Gramostola rosea or Porteri on this list. Those are absolutely terrible beginners. They're good in the sense that they are hardy, but they're boring. They're big brown spiders that don't eat very much and don't move very much. That gives a very bad taste in the mouth for a new hobbyist. I won't be recommending those ever to any new keeper. Final note about the slings. There is no generally beginner-friendly sling. They're not very forgiving in terms of humidity and food requirements. So while some are easier to care for than others, I wouldn't recommend a sling to any beginner. Juveniles and up. Alright, so I'm going to be splitting these beginner species up into different categories, and we're going to go through these one by one. Pick out what's most important to you. First up will be the beautiful. Chroma tapelma sanio pubescens, otherwise known as the green bottle blue tarantula, has been a staple in most beginners' arsenal for a very long time now. They're extremely hardy, they're absolutely gorgeous as you can see, and they're fairly easy to keep so long as you keep in mind that they are relatively fast. They web like it's going out of style. If you provide anchor points, they will make intricate web tunnels, and it's quite beautiful. Any enclosure will turn into a winter wonderland very, very quickly. In terms of humidity, provide bone dry substrate, just provide a water dish, and that is it. I don't care where you live, how dry it is. I live in the driest desert in the United States, and mine is on bone dry substrate. Just set them up, give them a hide, and let them web until their heart's content. Next up for the beautiful, it is the only arboreal that will be on this list. Unfortunately, there aren't very many arboreal beginner species. Avicularia avicularia, otherwise known as the pink toe tarantula for obvious reasons. 
I would never recommend this species as a sling or a juvenile to a beginner. They are notoriously fragile, sudden infant... Wait, wait a second. Sudden avic death syndrome is a common term. I don't like that term. It just means you weren't keeping it properly. Don't get them as a sling or as a juvenile. Adults are fine. Anything above two inches gets a little hardier. They exhibit absolutely beautiful colors. I love them. You won't get the best feeding response out of them, so if that's what you're looking for, look somewhere else. But if you're looking for glitz and glamour, that's your spider. Do you want to show off an interesting spider that most people don't know exist? Here's the strange category. Brachypelma albopelosum is known as the curly hair tarantula, and these grow to be a decent size at about 6 inches. They have these incredibly long setae where they get their name from, the curly hair. Shockingly, they have curly hair. In my opinion, they are absolutely beautiful. They tend to have a black body matched with blonde-ish setae. It makes them look almost like a mammal, actually, and I love them. They are typically very, very docile. I've never had one throw a threat posture or try and bite me. The worst I've had is some kicking hair, and their hair isn't even very bad. For most people, you want to provide absolutely bone-dry substrate for the juveniles and adults. However, with my environment, I do prefer to overflow the water dish about once every other week, give or take. Learn to read your tarantula. It'll tell you what it needs. Next up would be Afonapalma simani, the orange-tailed tarantula. I actually just made that name up. I don't know what the common name is, but we're going to come back to him later. Let's just say you want a giant freaking tarantula. You want something that's going to be a big spider, those Halloween decorations. Here are the massive beginner species. Gramistola polcrypes is known as the Chaco Golden Knee, and it's actually fairly closely related to Gramistola rosea and portaria, the rose hairs. These get to be quite large, at about 7 to 8 inches, more commonly 7 inches. The good news is that size doesn't come with any extra requirements in terms of husbandry. Keep them the same as you would a rosea, perhaps a little bit more humid, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. Overflow the water dish every week or so, and then that would be it. But honestly, bone dry substrate would be fine for most people. Now do be aware, they don't have terribly bad venom, it's not going to hurt too bad, but given their size, an adult could cause some serious mechanical damage if it were to bite. While they are fairly docile, they can bite, they have fangs, and it would hurt. Their fangs are about the size of a roof nail, you don't want to mess with them. The next one for the massive list is only for those that have had experience in some kind of exotic pet. You need to have that respect for a fast, aggressive animal. Mildly aggressive, at least. Acanthoscuria geniculata, also known as the Brazilian white knee. They get quite large, once again, at about 7 to 8 inches as adults. However, they are on that cusp of being a beginner and an intermediate species. Their feeding response is so wildly over the top that some people mistake them for being aggressive. They're actually not aggressive at all. They just think that anything moving is food, including you. Furthermore, they do kick hair, and the hair is pretty bad. When I recently rehoused my juvenile only about three inches, my arms were itching for days afterwards. I can't imagine getting that in your face or your eyes. That would be terrible. Once again, take some caution. Their venom isn't very bad, but if they were to bite you, and they want to bite you, this species always wants to bite you, it will hurt a lot. An adult's fangs are about the size of a roof nail, once again, and it would hurt a lot and cause a lot of mechanical damage. Again, I want to reiterate, this is on the cusp of being a beginner or an intermediate species. If you don't have experience with any other exotic pets, snakes, lizards, something, this is a bad idea. In all fairness, though, it's a fairly easy species to keep. Keep it a little humid, overflow the water dish every now and then, and you'll be fine. It's a joy to have. It's one of my favorite species. You just have to respect it. We went over the massive. Now let's talk about the itty-bitty. Both of these spiders are what are called dwarf tarantulas. They're, they're, they're not very big. They're tiny, tiny, little bitty tarantulas. They max out at about three inches, and that's as big as they're ever going to get. They're adorable, but they're tiny. 
First up would be Holothiel NCI. Now, this is actually the only tarantula that in the wild is naturally communal. You will find massive web mazes of these things, just hundreds of them, generations living together at a time. It's fascinating. I don't recommend that for a beginner, however. Once upon a time, I did have four Holothiel NCI or perhaps three. I'll be posting a picture here in a moment. The important part is that I now have one fat one. You can see what happened. That being said, I don't recommend the communal setup for beginners. I was intermediate at the time of me trying and I failed, failed miserably. This spider is an extremely heavy webber. It's beautiful what it does, and it's usually a pretty heavy burrower. Personally, mine has chosen to not burrow whatsoever. I have found that if you provide plenty of webbing anchor points, chopsticks, toothpicks, whatever, it will feel content enough in its webbing that it won't feel the need to burrow. Personally, this is my setup. Just a little substrate in case it ever does decide to burrow, but this is the one that just hasn't chosen to. It just webs everything. He's hanging out in there, doesn't really care too much. It is a mildly humid species, so you will see quite a bit of humid substrate in there. Back to humidity for a moment, because I didn't want to talk about it while holding a live creature. Just keep it moist for the most part. You don't want to let it completely dry out, and you'll be fine. These things max out at about three inches. The males are even smaller once they're a mature male. And their venom is completely insignificant to humans, whether it be from potency or amount. Either way, it doesn't really hurt us. And the fangs, of course, are so tiny that it doesn't really hurt either. So you don't need to worry about that. However, what you do need to worry about is how fast they are. Given that they are a dwarf, they can move extremely quickly if they want to. This has been my only escape since I've started keeping tarantulas, and luckily I found him. Or her. That being said, as I always say, have a catch cub nearby. Moving on, we have the Hapalopus species Columbia small. Now there are two different Hapalopus species, Columbia, small and the large. Even the large isn't very large, but the small maxes out at about three, maybe four inches for some individuals. They are a medium weber that does enjoy the humidity, but is able to deal with droughts quite well. I keep mine on mildly damp substrate, but quite honestly, I accidentally let it dry out more than a couple times in the past, and he is just fine. In fact, he recently just matured, and I'm trying to find a female for him. Once again, just like the Holothiel NCI, they are extremely fast. I've had this one bolt on me more than a couple times, so have a catch cup nearby. But again, negligible venom, and their fangs are so small that it won't cause any mechanical damage. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't know why you would want this as a pet, but I had to include it on this list because it's a very common trait among tarantulas. The pet rock. That's right, it was not just a fad from the 70s, or was it 80s? I don't know, I wasn't alive yet. But the point remains that Brachypelma amelia is a pet rock. I am not exaggerating even a little bit when I say that an adult of this species will very easily outlive any houseplant you have lying around. If this spider dies under your care, you shouldn't own anything living. Please don't reproduce. This is an incredible display spider. Mine pretty much ignores its hide. In fact, it uses its hide to stand on top of the hide just to show off her beautiful colors at all times about her colors. Look at that. It is a perfect equilateral triangle. It's absolutely gorgeous. This is my favorite aesthetic spider that I have ever seen. The first time I saw this spider, I actually thought it was Photoshop. There are absolutely zero additional requirements for this spider. Provide a hide, provide a water dish, provide a proper sized enclosure, and that is it. Leave it alone. Feed it once a month at the most, and you're good. It's a display spider. Hey, look at the spider I have. And that's it. This species is extremely sturdy under hot or cold weather. It is from the desert, and cold doesn't seem to bother it very much, so don't worry about either one of those things. I got my adult female about two years ago, probably a little bit more at this point, and I can count on one hand how many times she has eaten. I offer food, she just doesn't want it. 
Seriously, though, for a moment, when you have an adult of this species, one roach or a few crickets per month is way more than enough food. Keep in mind, they can overeat. If they have a nice plump abdomen, leave them alone. They are trees. They can store fat for a very long time. Lastly, we have the opposite of a pet rock, the active spider. Now, I did tell you before that we were going to come back to a Fonopalmacy Manny, the orange tail name that I made up. That's this one. They are extremely active in my experience. They are a shallow burrower, so be, be sure to provide plenty of burrowing space for this to do their thing. Now, there's overlap here between the strange and the active. These have bright orange spinnerets, those things that actually make the webs on the back of the abdomen. It's quite interesting. I'm not sure why they developed this, but it's a very interesting characteristic. They're out very often. Mine seems to always be doing something, excavating, burrowing, moving her ping pong ball around. Very often this thing is moving, especially if you've had the light off for more than 10 minutes. Now this one does require some humidity, so do overflow the water dish and wet different parts of the enclosure every now and then, but it can handle droughts at the same time, so you're allowed to make mistakes here. Alright, so here's a little bit of a tangent. You can skip this part if you want to. The entire point of this video is I see way too many people on the forums buying advanced species just for the colors or the activeness or some other reason that it doesn't even matter. Let me tell you what advanced species tend to be like. A pet hole, or a ghost, or so fragile that they're going to die if you don't know what you're doing. It goes beyond you not knowing what you're doing. It's not a great beginner species for a multitude of reasons. And the one you're going to care about is you're spending a lot of money on an expensive spider that you won't enjoy. All of these spiders you will actually enjoy. So please trust me when I say I have tried all of these species, I have tried the advanced species as well, and I am actually not a fan of a lot of the advanced species. Of course I can't stop you from getting an orange bitey thing, or a polycolotheria, or whatever you want to get, but at the very least check these out. If you decide to get an advanced species later, please ask for advice because you don't know what you're doing. But the beginner species, you'll be able to handle and trust me when I say you'll enjoy them. They're way more fun than most advanced species. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and step off my soapbox here. I truly do hope that I help someone with this make a decision on a new spider. Maybe your first, maybe your second, third, or if you've had 30 and maybe didn't have one of these, try them out. I love all of these species. I've kept all of them. They're a joy. I really highly recommend all of them. Out of all of those, my personal favorite would be a Campuscuria geniculata, that Brazilian white knee that I spoke about that's on the cusp of beginner to intermediate. Again, you want to have some experience, but you're not getting it way over your head. I love this species, amazing feeding response, you won't be disappointed. As always, if you have any questions about any of these species, feel free to ask in the comments. I will always respond to questions, I promise. Be sure to subscribe and share this with your friends. If you found it helpful, maybe they'll find it helpful too. Maybe their friends will find it helpful. I'd like to reach as many people as I can with these because I legitimately want to help grow this hobby. And the only way I'm going to do that is to speak to as many people as possible. Alright, so that's enough of that. Once again, I have been Oilers K, this has been Randy Aid, and I will see you next time.